Okay, well, let's say a look here about fertilization. Of course, that's one of the first steps in development. The whole idea behind fertilization is you've got two haploid genomes from the sperm, of course, and from the egg. Those are the only and higher organisms. All the cells in the organism, except for the gametes and their immediate precursors, like the spermatocytes and things like that, and the old, or early oocytes, are diploid. And then the only haploid cells you have are the gametes and their immediate precursors. Now, by the way, there's a good reason for most higher organisms, their cells being diploid. You've got your chromosomes backed up. If you lose one gene, you have that backup copy on the other chromosome. It's just like uh, uh, a couple days ago, the hard, one of the hard drives on my computer at home gave up the ghost. I wake up the, in the morning and can't get anything from that hard drive. But fortunately, I had all the data on a second independent drive, so I didn't lose anything except the 100 bucks is going to cost to replace the drive. Okay. So at least I didn't lose any data, 600 gigabytes or so, that's a lot of data to lose. So at any rate, yeah, backing it up. So that way, if you're haploid and you lose a gene, you lose a gene, you got no backup copy. Uh, so one of the only things that spend most of the time in the haploid state um, in eukaryotes are going to be things like protists. Most protists are, pro are haploid and then only become diploid when you have fertilization, then they undergo immediate meiosis and go back to the haploid state. So we can look at, excuse me, look at algae and paramecia and that kind of stuff under the microscope. Those guys spend most of the time in the haploid state. But high organisms, diploid, and the only haploid cells we have are going to be the gametes and the precursors. So we're going to take these two haploid genomes, merge them together. So that's one of the big functions. Back to the diploid state, containing alleles from both parents. And if you're lucky, the combination of the two parental alleles may make you more fit for that particular environment. Of course, they may make you less fit for that particular environment, but maybe your brother or sister is more fit, whatever the case is. Okay, the other thing you have, another reason for sex, aside from generating more genetic variation, the other thing is different receptors that are targets for parasites, viruses, and what have you. By playing around with these, you stay one step ahead of the parasites. That's a common theory about one of the major reasons for sex, is staying, keeping ahead of parasites, whether they're eukaryotic or multicellular, like worms and stuff like that, or whether they're bacteria, viruses, protists, what have you. So that's another kind of reason for sex. And the third reason, of course, is a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. But the idea of body fertilization. First, you've got to take those two haploid genomes together. Second, you want species specificity. You want to select that the gamete that you're going to merge with is from your own kind. It's from your own species. Now, that sounds a little bit weird for us, right? <laughs> most people, you can probably find exceptions on the internet if you look hard enough, but most people prefer to mate with members of their own species rather than members of other species. You might go find some of that guy's stuff on the internet, I don't know. But Do not <laughs> Google that. <laughs> But it's generally considered a crime and a sin in most cultures. You know? <laughs> okay. All right, but at any rate, it's certainly biologically very unproductive. But at any rate, on the other hand, if you're an aquatic organism, think of this. You have shed your gametes. There could be a whole bunch of other species, eggs, or sperm around in the same environment you could have a chance of accidentally fertilizing the wrong egg or accidentally being fertilized by the wrong sperm. And when that happens, of course, the results are genetic disaster. Most of the time, you're going to get very rapid developmental rest. If you're very close to related species, you may get some kind of development, but rarely can even close to related species hybridize effect. Think of, think of mules, a horse and a donkey. They're very closely related equids, 
and yet the offspring are sterile. Dogs and wolves can hybridize fairly easily because dogs are basically domesticated African gray wolves. So, yeah, they're, they're genetically very, very similar. So they can actually hybridize successfully. I would not advise keeping dog-wolf hybrids as pets. Some people do, but they are potentially dangerous. Um, and, uh, you know, so most times cross-species hybridization, even between closely related species, doesn't work out very well. It usually can happen, but it doesn't work. Of course, distantly related species, forget it. Often you also have differences in chromosome number. Boy, can that screw up things like cell division and things like that. So, if you're in an environment, especially where you may be facing gametes of multiple different species, you have to be specific. You have to select and make sure that only the right kind of sperm will fertilize the right kind of eggs. That's true with plants, too. We're approaching pollen season. Especially for gymnosperms and grasses, which are wind pollinating, there's going to be pollen of all kinds. You don't want pine sperm landing on a grass flower and attempting to fertilize it. So once again, we have species selectivity. So that's another thing, species selectivity. Okay, a third thing that fertilization does is it initiates the program for early development. What we often call egg activation. Because we mentioned before, and, and had we had more time in class, we would have gone over gametogenesis, formation of sperm egg. But during oogenesis, the formation of the eggs, we are going to load the eggs up with messenger RNAs coding for various proteins, things like that, and many times with proteins, especially large amounts of histones and other proteins. Many of these molecules either code for transcription factors or are transcription factors or what have you. In that way, you have the molecules you need for early development to proceed. As a matter of fact, you can actually block transcription completely in many oocytes, and they will develop to a certain point before they arrest. If you take those sea urchins or starfish, for instance, you can block RNA synthesis completely, and they will develop normally almost to the point of gastrulation. They arrest just before gastrulation. Frog eggs will go not quite as far, but close, close enough. Now, mammalian eggs, apparently, they can only on stored developmental program, they can only go about three rounds of cell division before they kind of realize that they're missing something. Uh, so, but the point is here, we have a program for development stored in the oocyte in the form of molecules, messenger RNAs and proteins. Some of these molecules are polarized, meaning they're put in specific locations of the oocyte. For instance, we may have certain signaling molecules or certain transcription factors that are concentrated to one part of the, of the egg or another. And the cells that have, when the egg divides, the cells that have those molecules will then start developing in a different way than the cells that won't have them. So we see examples, numerous examples of that in film. Well, the thing is, this idea of egg activation is basically we double click on the icon, early development 1.0, and the program runs. As a matter of fact, you can activate eggs even without fertilization, either chemically or many times mechanically, just sticking a needle into an egg, in many cases will actually activate the eggs program. And then all of a sudden, after a while, it realizes it doesn't have that second genome, and then it arrests. But that program is stored and laid down during oogenesis. Fertilization can, will start that program to run. Okay, so those are major functions of fertilization here. All right, now, next thing. Fertilization, of course, requires interactions between the appropriate egg and the appropriate sperm. <coughs> In order to do these interactions, we need to have 
certain kinds of specialized structures in both the egg and the sperm cell that are going to play important roles in fertilization. So let's take a look at these things and see some of these structures. First, let's look at the egg, or more properly, the oocyte. Okay, here's the egg's plasma or outer membrane. Now on the outside of the plasma membrane is a thin layer of proteins and polysaccharides and glycoproteins. This is what we call the vitellin or egg membrane. It's connected to the plasma membrane by receptor proteins that stretch from the plasma membrane and actually go into the vitellin membrane. Now mammals, by the way, that vitellin membrane, this is for all you medical types, is called the zona pellucida. It's the same thing. <clears throat> It's just they give it a fancy Latin name so that only doctors can understand it, right? <laughs> that way they can charge enormous amounts of money. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, so we have this vitella membrane. Obviously, since this is outside the cell, it's a secreted product. In a sense, it's a form of extracellular matrix. And then we have various receptors. The receptors, some of them will extend all the way into the vitellin membrane and even beyond. Many eggs, like our sea urchin eggs, a lot, especially a lot of aquatic eggs, have a polysaccharide based jelly exterior. Now, mammalian eggs, by the way, don't have that, but many eggs do. Our sea urchin eggs, do, if you've ever looked at uh, amphibian eggs, they have that. Fish eggs frequently have things like that. That jelly coat has a number of different functions, um, depending on the type of egg. Here again, this is more secreted extracellular matrix type material. Um, now one thing with the uh, jelly coat, in many cases, sea urchins being an example, they do have some receptors in there. Sometimes these membrane receptors extend all the way into the jelly coat. Other times there are separate receptors that are involved in fertilization. They're located, they're not necessarily proteins either, but are located in the jelly coat. The egg jelly also has other kinds of functions. If you've ever seen amphibians or in many fish, what they'll do is they'll use that because it's sticky and stuff like that to attach it to surface, like attach it to rocks, undersides of leaves and things like that. Yes? And this is what we like did in lab where we Right, we removed okay. the egg jelly and the egg jelly happens to have some, I believe it's a lipid that actually is going to trigger off the sperm's response. Okay, so yeah, we'll, we'll see more on that kind of stuff later. Not all eggs have that, but that the kind of derm eggs do. Okay, so uh, like I said, the jelly it attaches things to serve. The other thing, since it's larger, it makes it a little bit more difficult for predators to eat these things. Some of them presumably have toxic or distasteful substances in them to discourage predation. So, have you ever seen something like a clutch of salamander eggs? You know, the eggs are like a couple millimeters across, and the, the jelly is like this thick. So it means you're going to have to be a much larger predator to actually eat those eggs. Because, of course, just like us, a lot of animals like eating eggs. They're rich in nutrition, taste great, less filling, and <coughs> stuff like that. So you want to protect. So the egg jelly uh, organisms that have jelly-coated eggs, that actually plays numerous important roles, especially in protection from predators and things like that. Okay, so we have that. This is all extracellular matrix and it's produced, made, and produced in the secretory pathway and then exported out. Okay, so we have that. Now, the next thing we have is just underneath the plasma membrane of the egg is a whole bunch of packed secretory vesicles, just a fraction of a micrometer beneath the egg, beneath the egg plasma membrane. And these are called the cortical. The cortex refers to the area just beneath the plasma membrane. We call these the cortical vesicles or cortical granules can also be used. Their membrane-bound compartments produce 
butted off the Golgi apparatus, produced a secretory pathway, and then contains various substances, enzymes, and other things that are going to be essential in fertilization. And this seems to be a common element in fertilization, these so-called cortical vesicles or cortical granules by the thousands just beneath the eggs plasma membrane. So all of these are important equipment for fertilization to occur and for the egg to respond properly to sperm. Now once again, these receptors are going to be tied into signaling pathways, especially the phosphoinositide signaling pathway. That plays critical roles in fertilization. Okay, and we have numerous transport proteins, ion channels, and things like that in the membrane as well. Okay, next thing, let's take a look at the spleen, see what the spleen has. All right. critical portions of a sperm cell. Okay, going back here. Sperm, of course, if you don't get to the egg fast, somebody else's sperm will. So, there's strong selective pressure for sperm to get as streamlined and as fast as possible. After all, you're going to spread your genes Better if your sperm can get to somebody else's eggs faster than your neighbor's sperm can. So what we have here, sperm are very compact cells with a strong propulsive apparatus. And what that apparatus is, of course, is a flagella. A flagella is a specialized array of microtubules and microtubule motor proteins and other things like that. And it causes a whipping motion, kind of like cracking a bullwhip when you add ATP to it. So the thing whips around like a bullwhip and that generates the movement. Sillier, shorter versions of flagella, same thing. Flagella originate from structures called basal bodies. The centrioles or centrosomes are actually another version of that type of thing. Okay, and then surrounding the base of flagella are going to be a whole bunch of mitochondria. So of course, mitochondria provide the ATP you need to power the flagella. And the flagella goes through ATP like a Humvee goes through gas. If you ever had one of those, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so the idea. You want this guy to move fast. Because if he doesn't, somebody else will. And he's, that somebody else is going to get there first. Second thing, the nucleus. Nucleus of sperm are extremely compact. They're much smaller than the nuclei you find in either their precursor cells, like the spermatogonia and stuff, or in other cell types. If, if you add nuclear stains, they appear black. They're so densely packed. Part of the reason why is the chromatin, the DNA protein complexes, are packed in an exceptionally tight configuration much more tightly packed than mitotic chromosomes. Part of the reason for it is during spermatogenesis, we replace some of the histone proteins. The histone proteins make the nucleosomes that pack DNA together and organize it, and of course also are involved in regulation, transcription, stuff like that. We cover that with chromatin structure, epigenetics, and what have you. Well, some of the histones, some of those core, what are called core histones, 
get replaced by these pro small, highly basic, highly positively charged proteins called protamines. Protamines bind DNA even more tightly than histones do. So when you replace, we make nucleosomes that have protamines in place of certain histones, it compacts the thing extremely tightly. Now this chromatin here is unavailable for transcription. You cannot transcribe chromatin in mature sperm. It's too tightly packed and nothing can get in. Okay, so these, transcriptionally, these guys are toast. They're dead until you finally remove the protamines and put the normal histones back in. But the idea is you make the nucleus as compact as possible. Now, finally, at the head of the sperm, we have this secretory vesicle that's called the acrosome. The acrosome is critical for the events of fertilization. It's a giant secretory vesicle that's loaded up with various kinds of enzyme and enzymes and are released just after, at the very beginnings of fertilization. And that is also made during spermatogenesis. Okay, now, some invertebrate sperm this does not happen in vertebrates, but it does happen in many invertebrates. Just behind the acrosome, between the nucleus and the acrosome, is a mass of the protein called actin. Okay, vertebrates do not have this. This mass of actin, either in the single subunit or G-actin form, but complex with another protein to prevent it from spontaneously forming microfilaments, or in some cases microfilaments that are twisted up into like a tightly coiled watch spring and held in place by other kinds of proteins, is what we call aflafilamentous actin. In other words, it's a microfilament, a twisted up microfilament. You find that. That's in invertebrates only. That plays an assistance in fertilization in invertebrate species, including things like starfish and sea urchins. It does not happen in vertebrates. We don't have that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's a major equipment we see in sperm and egg that are necessary for fertilization.